Charlotte and welcome to this talk at the Polyglot Conference, Once Upon a Time, What Celtic Folklore Can Tell Us About the People of These Islands. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the ways in which folklore can be used to give us insights into different cultures, in particular the remaining six living Celtic languages and the nations they stem from. Specifically, we are going to be looking at the six living Celtic languages and their nations, what folklore is and why it matters, how folklore complements language learning, then we'll be taking some, a look at some specific examples from each of these nations and at the end we will take a look at some modern, mostly digital folklore. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So we're going to start with a quick introduction to the Celtic languages and their nations. The Celtic languages are a group of Indo-European languages that descended from Proto-Celtic. During the first millennium BCE, these languages were spoken across much of Europe and central Anatolia but now they are restricted to the northwestern fringe of Europe and a few diaspora communities. The six remaining living Celtic languages are Scottish Gaelic, Irish, Manx, Welsh, Cornish and Breton. These are all insular Celtic languages as they all originated from the islands that make up the United Kingdom and, the, and Ireland today. Breton is the only one that's not still spoken on these islands today, instead it's spoken in France where it was brought to you by settlers from Britain which still makes it an insular Celtic language. There were continental Celtic languages such as Celtiberian, Galatian and Gaulish, but there are no speakers of these languages remaining today. All six languages are, a min are minority languages in the countries where they're spoken and all are considered to be at least vulnerable by UNESCO, which means that they're in danger of becoming extinct. The insular Celtic languages are made up of two branches, Goidelic and Bretonic. The Goidelic languages are Irish, Scottish Gaelic and Manx and they all descended from Old Irish. And the Britonic languages are Welsh, Cornish and Breton, all of which descended from British. There are plenty of debates about how the languages should be split and where they originally came from, but that's not the focus of this talk and that's a very interesting question. For now, we are going to take a short look at each of the languages in turn, travelling from north to south. Scottish Gaelic is one of three main languages spoken in Scotland, the other two being the Germanic languages Scots and English. In 2011, it was estimated that there are around 57,000 speakers, but there's also a small community of speakers in Canada, especially in Nova Scotia, who speak a dialect known as Canadian Gaelic. Scottish Gaelic became a distinct spoken language sometime in the 13th century, though its literary language only split in the 16th century. Nowadays, the highest percentage of Gaelic speakers live in the Outer Hebrides, and there are lots of efforts being put into its continued survival. Manx has had an interesting journey as a language. Ned Madrill, considered to be the last person who grew up in a Manx-speaking community environment and who spoke Manx fluently, died in 1974, and for a while UNESCO listed the language as extinct. However, it never fell completely out of use, and due to the fact there have been efforts to maintain it since the 19th century, as well as many records of the language, it's been pretty successfully revived, with around 50 first language speakers and 1,800 second language speakers living on the island today. Like Scottish Gaelic, Manx descended from Old Irish, but it diverged considerably from the Gaelic languages of Scotland and Ireland between 1400 and 1900, although it is clearly still more closely related to them than to the Britonic languages. Irish originated on the island of Ireland and was the population's first language until the late 18th century. Over 1.85 million people across the island claim to be somewhat proficient with the language, Although daily users outside the education system are estimated to number around 73,000, so 1.5% of the population. Interestingly, Irish has the oldest vernacular literature in Western Europe, as it has a written form, Ogham, that dates back to at least the 4th century. Irish has also been written in Latin from the 5th century, so there are many records that detail changes in the language over time. Irish is the national and first official language of the Republic of Ireland and is an officially recognised language in Northern Ireland, as well as being an official language of the European Union. There are three major dialects of the language, Munster, Connacht and Ulster, as well as a standard written form which was developed by a parliamentary commission in the 1950s. The Welsh language developed from the language of the Britons, though its emergence is not clearly identifiable. Instead, this shift occurred over a long period of time, with some historians claiming it may have happened as late as the 9th century. However, Welsh has been spoken continuously in Wales throughout recorded history, though by 1911 it had become a minority language and was spoken by 43.5% of the population. As of 2020, an estimated 884,000 people, so 29.1% of the population, speak Welsh in Wales, with another 110,000 speakers in England, up to about 5,000 in Argentina where there's a Welsh colony, and just under 4,000 in Canada, 
In Wales, 16.3% of the population report that they speak Welsh on a daily basis, making it the healthiest of any of the Celtic languages in terms of its use. Like Manx, Cornish is a revival success story, having become extinct as a first language in Cornwall in the late 18th century. A revival began in the early 20th century, and now there are estimated to be around 2,000 speakers of the language. Cornish was the main language of Cornwall for centuries, but was pushed westwards by English. It continued to function as a common community language in parts of Cornwall until the mid-18th century, and there's some evidence of knowledge of language persisting into the 19th century, so it's possible that this knowledge overlapped with when revival efforts began, which almost certainly would have helped them. Cornish is very closely related to Breton, and the two languages were mutually intelligible until well into the Middle Ages. Breton is the only Celtic language still in use on the European mainland, where it's spoken in Brittany, France. It was brought from Great Britain to Armorica by migrating Britons during the early Middle Ages. In 1950, there were around 1 million speakers of Breton, but by the first decade of the 21st century, they were estimated to only be 200,000. However, there have been efforts to prevent the language sliding into extinction, with the number of children attending bilingual classes rising by 33% between 2006 and 2012. In 2018, there were 210,000 native speakers in Brittany, with another 16,000 in Ile-de-France, including their students in bilingual education. So, now we've got a quick handle on the Celtic languages, we can move on to folklore. Specifically, what is it, and why does it matter? It's probably better to start with what is culture, rather than what is folklore, as it's culture that gives rise to the groups who then create their own folklore. Anthropologist Ward Goodenow defined culture as Whatever it is, one has to know or believe in order to act in a manner acceptable to a society's members. So culture is knowledge that is possessed by a particular group. This group, of course, does not need to be united by a single language or nation. For folklorists, these folk groups are people who often share unofficial cultures together. Nowadays, that can even be a group who just share one common factor. What is important to note, however, in the realm of folklore is that the culture being referred to is never institutional. For example, if a group of students are being studied as a folk group, the folk culture is what exists outside of the campus or university institution. If a group doesn't have an institutional culture at all, for example groups of friends or a family, they're typically entirely folk or informal in their cultural existence and expression. So then folklore, as Lynnes McNeil describes it in her book Folklore Rules, comprises the specific expressive forms that a group uses to communicate and interact. These forms are called the genres of folklore, and then folklorists study the different genres, which are things like customs, narratives, and beliefs. And there are two main elements when it comes to deciding whether something is folklore or not. Is it informal, so does it feature variation? And is it traditional, so is it passed on? This is what sets folklore apart from other cultural expressions. The way in which it moves through a population is so crucial. Folklore is typically shared by word of mouth and generally person to person. It also likely changes as it passes along and is most often anonymous. This is different to pop culture or elite culture where a single story or expression is heard from one main source, with elite culture generally having a smaller, more narrow audience than pop culture. However, these categories are still vague. For example, symphonies are an example of elite culture and these can still be transmitted in a folk way, as can mass media references. As folklore is adapted and moulded every time that it's passed on, after a while it becomes representative of a group as a whole instead of a single individual. This is why it can give us insights into a group, particularly into group consensus, because the parts that people thought were especially important or significant or relevant remain and are then continually passed on. Why then does folklore persist? If we have access to pop culture and increasingly to elite culture, then what purpose does folklore serve? Folklorist William Bascom wrote an article called The Four Functions of Folklore, in which he listed the ways in which folklore can serve a population. Folklore can entertain, it can validate a culture's customs and rituals, it can teach lessons, and it can help exercise social control. The same piece of folklore can also serve multiple functions at once. Fairy tales are a good example of this, as longer narratives have more room to explore different functions. If a piece of folklore is still living, that is, if it's still being transmitted from person to person today, then we can deduce that there are parts of it that are still relevant to the group passing it along. And this shows us another difference between folklore, mass media and elite culture. Because the folk group maintains control of folk culture, once a story or a joke or anything else becomes irrelevant, it's just not passed on anymore. We are, of course, here at an online language conference, so what does folklore have to do with language learning? Well, as we've already seen, folklore and culture are intrinsically tied together, 
And we know too that the goal of learning a language is also to learn about the culture in which that language is spoken. When learning a language, of course, you'll tend to learn more about the dominant culture of that language, or if not the dominant culture of the language, then the dominant culture of a nation or an area in which the language is spoken. Sabina Magliocco pointed out in her article, Language Teaching, Preliminary Remarks and Practical Suggestions, that although the study of folklore and the study of language share a historical link in their early 19th century emergence, not a lot of research has been done into how folklore specifically is used to help teach languages, because folklore isn't often used in this context, or because it's used informally, or because folklore is passed over in favour of other exercises. In fact, it's tended to be that folklore materials have been used specifically with non-Western languages where other materials were not readily available. But as using aspects of popular culture within the classroom is becoming more common, so is the idea of using folklore also becoming more acceptable. Because folklore usually shows group consensus, it can represent the way that group thinks or what they believe about something. In other words, it allows us, the learners, access to this culture as something closer to insiders. If we compare a piece of folklore with a TV episode, for example, we can note a few things. A TV episode has creators. Usually this is a small team of people with a head writer, a director, and a team of executives who have the final say on what is being produced. On the other hand, our piece of folklore is the product of group effort and group agreement and doesn't belong to a single person, so we can extrapolate more about the group as a whole. The TV episode is designed to entertain or inform a specific group of people, a target audience. For example, a programme might be designed for teen girls, and it represents what these creators believe about that age demographic and gender, which may or may not be backed by research. Or it might be targeted for an international market and thus soften or change aspects of the source country's culture that might be considered controversial in other regions. Folklore is designed for the in-group, which does mean that some initial understanding of context may be required, but it allows for a much more truthful representation of what this folk group needs to be entertained or what the lessons are that this group as a whole believes are important to pass on. Another reason to study folklore is a really simple one. You are just far more likely to come across it. Remember that folklore is not just fairy tales and myths, it can encompass proverbs, graffiti, folk songs, riddles, jokes, festivals, customs, material cultures, foodways, and other things as well. For example, we can do this very easily with English. Um, if we take this proverb, a bad workman always blames his tools, what's it saying to us? Well, at first glance it's saying that someone's done a poor job and they're blaming their equipment. So they're doing this instead of taking responsibility for their actions. And we don't ever hear this said positively about someone, so it's a negative thing. So what is it teaching us? It's teaching us that we should take responsibility for the things that we do. So when learning a language like this, folklore makes it easier for us to interpret the implicit meaning, which even if the language of, say, the proverb aligns across different languages, it may still differ depending on culture. Folklore also allows for another important dimension when it comes to language learning. We are able to explore more diversity within the people who speak our target languages. Often when we're learning a language, we learn about one geographical area and learn one usually standardised form of that language. Of course, with regards to the standardised language, that makes sense, especially for beginners. But it is important to diversify who we're learning about when we learn a language, because there are plenty of different folk groups and cultures that make up the population of people who speak our target language. So, let's begin with our first folkloric creature from our first Celtic nation, Selkies. If you haven't heard of Selkies before, they are mythological beings that have the ability to transform from seal to human form by shedding their skin. Many stories that refer to them generally come from the Shetland or the Orkney Islands, but they are mentioned across Scottish, Irish and Manx mythology, as well as in Norse mythology. The term we use for them in English as well, Selkie, is not in fact Celtic in origin. It's a diminutive of the Scots word for seal, which strictly speaking means grey seal and is derived from the Old English term for a seal. When it comes to Gaelic language stories about Selkies, specific terms aren't used that often. In fact, most of the time the term for mermaid is used, indicating that there historically was considered to be no difference between them. The only term specifically referring to a Selkie is Majin Roin, which literally means seal maiden, but you won't see or hear this very often. However, it is these seal maidens who are most often represented when it comes to selkie tales. Many stories involve an island man coming across a group of selkies who are in their human forms, their seal skin left out to dry on the rocks, and taking a fancy to one of the beautiful women he sees. He then steals her skin, and by refusing to give it back, binds her to the land. She marries him and they have children, but no matter how much she loves their family, she misses the sea and what she left behind. 
Either by sheer accident or with the help of one of her children, one day the Selkie woman comes across her skin again. She leaves the family behind, often leaving the man to raise their children, and returns to the sea and in many stories to a husband she has left behind. We can contrast this with the Selkie man who appears to be able to come and go as he pleases. He never gives up his skin, instead seducing island women and then, when a child is born as a result of their union, offering payment for the care the mother has bestowed upon it. Two famous ballads, The Great Silky of Solskeri and The Lady Odiver, deal with the consequences of women who've had relationships with Selkie men. But what can Selkies tell us about Celtic society? Well, it's important to remember that we should look at these stories as being steeped in the time in which we find them. In that case, the stories themselves certainly tell us something about women, about the attitude toward them and the treatment of them in the places and eras in which the stories were told. Although a woman does not give up her skin when she gets married, historically marriage has been a turning point in how a woman is viewed, in a shift in her domain to focus on the domestic realm of childcare and housekeeping. These stories can represent a desire for more, especially with regards to the selkie women who are longing for the sea, and this would probably be particularly true for women who find themselves trapped in unhappy marriages. Selkie males were not confined by the same rules as their female counterparts, but the human women who had children with them often came across tragedy later in life. In both the ballads I mentioned before, the human Selkie children are killed by the human husband of their mothers. The suspected origins of Selkies might also tell us something about the people who invented stories about them. One belief is that Selkies originate from the Finnish and Sami men and women who arrived in Scotland wearing furs and sealskin clothing. Sealskin gets waterlogged really easily, and so it would make sense for the new arrivals to leave their clothes out to dry before carrying on their journey. And this image of a human sunning on the rocks, their sealskin drying nearby, is central to most stories about Selkies. Alternatively, Selkies could be related to the Scandinavian myths of the Finn folk. These were actually believed to be stories about the Sami people, who were believed to be powerful sorcerers. In stories that come from the Orkney Islands, Selkies and Finfolk are two separate mythological races, but they were believed to be the same thing on the Shetland Islands, with the Finfolk having the ability to shapeshift into seals. And there are, of course, other theories. Seals have very human-like eyes, so perhaps people believe they could transform. Shipwrecked Spaniards with their long dark hair might have looked vaguely like seals washed up onto the shore. Or even that Selkies might help explain a medical condition called syndactyly, which is webbed fingers or toes, as this was believed to arise when a child was the offspring of a human and Selkie union. No matter the origin of Selkies, their presence tells us a lot about the historical interactions between people from Nordic countries and those who lived along the North Seaway, as well as attitudes towards and warnings for women who might want to stray from what was expected of them. We're going to take a trip down to Ireland now and take a look at a creature called the Fear Gurta. He is the man of hunger and was a phantom of hunger who resembled an emaciated human. According to legend, he would beg for alms from passers-by and if you were to give him something, you would be rewarded. It is suspected that the origins of the Thea Gorta lie in the Irish famine of the 1840s, but he can also be linked to earlier fairy myths. As Patricia Monaghan points out in the Encyclopedia of Celtic Mythology and Folklore, folklore is never static. Significant historical moments find their ways into folk tales. Of course, the Irish famine is perhaps the most devastating thing to have happened on the island throughout its history, and this is reflected in the folklore that stemmed from it. If you don't know anything about the Irish famine, then let me briefly explain. When the English occupied Ireland, Irish farmers were denied the right to own land. This meant most of them lived as the tenants of landlords who still lived in England. Because they couldn't own land, these Irish farmers had no right to the foods they were farming, and so they had to find something they could grow to eat. Potatoes had fairly recently been brought over from South America, and these grew really well in the Irish climate, so growing some potatoes on a small patch of land could provide enough food for a farming family to eat, and this meant that potatoes really became a staple of the Irish diet at this time. The issue with this is that if you only have one crop and something happens to it, you have a really serious problem, and in 1848, an airborne fungus caused the potatoes to turn into black slime immediately after they were harvested. Now, the worst part of all of this was that there was enough food to sustain the Irish population, Cattle were still being ready for market, but because these livestock belonged to the absent landlords, millions of people starved because they weren't allowed to eat them. Throughout the Irish famine, in fact, food was continually being exported from Ireland, all as people starved. The potato blight passed within the decade, but the effects of the famine were still felt for years afterwards. This was not only because between a million and a million and a half people died, but also because about that many people emigrated so they could survive. 
The first census immediately after the Great Famine recorded a population of 6.55 million people in Ireland. This has only been surpassed since in 2016 when the population was recorded at 6.66 million. So from this absolutely devastating event grew these legends of the Fear Gorta and the Fear Gortach. The Fear Gortach, the hungry grass, is a patch of soil that is so infected with memories of the Great Famine that anyone who steps on it is instantly hit with an insatiable hunger and they soon die even if they've just eaten. It is sometimes said that the hungry grass grows over the unmarked graves of famine victims or that it can spring up wherever people have died of hunger. Another legend of the Fear Gortach not necessarily related to the Great Famine itself, is that it tends to occur in mountainous regions. This could be linked to the fact that if you work a long day in the mountains, you're obviously going to be tired and feel weak afterwards, and it could explain away why people were eating, but when they were coming down, they were still feeling faint and had to sit and rest. The custom was to take some oat and bread with you, which is also seen in stories collected from the National Folklore Collection of Ireland, which details accounts from a range of people who had heard of the phenomenon. What then do the Fair Gorta and the Fair Gortach tell us about Ireland? In this case, that folklore can carry the after effects of trauma through a population, through generations, but with the aim of preparing those future generations on how to ward against the same thing happening again. The Isle of Man, like most of our Celtic nations, features many different water spirits, including creatures like the Kabalushti, the Tarushti, and the Glashtin. In fact, it can be difficult to differentiate between the three. Much like with selkies, mermaids and finfolk, they're often conflated with one another. If you know Little Manx, then the first two names make the forms of the mythological creatures clear. Kabul means horse, and ushti means water, so a kabul ushti is a water horse, kind of like a kelpie. Taru means bull, so a taru ushti is a water bull. Glashan is different. It is thought to derive from the old Irish word glace, which meant stream or sometimes even the sea. So the name of the Glashtin gives us no insight into its form, except that it's related to the water. It's been described as a water horse, but also as a goblin that appears out of its aquatic habitat so it can have contact with people who live on the island. Often, a Glashtin was described as being a handsome man with curly hair, which hid horse ears underneath if the person was able to look closely enough. No matter their outward appearance, Glashtins will most often be found doing one of two things. Looking for someone to ride them, or sneaking into the homes of young women to drag them out to sea. Choosing to ride a Glashtin doesn't do much to save you from the latter fate either. According to legend, they carry their riders back to the sea where they too drown. Other beliefs surrounding Glashtin includes the fact that if you can control one, they can be put to good use as farmhands, or that their cries warned people about oncoming storms, storms that the islanders suspected the Glashtin did cause. However, these beliefs varied more wildly from region to region than those of Glashtin carrying people off to their deaths. There are, of course, similar creatures across different areas of Celtic folklore, but the presence of all these stories could, as Yvonne Cresswell's pointed out, be viewed primarily as cautionary tales about how one should treat them or not for one's own personal safety and well-being. As we move from the Isle of Man into Wales and to the first of our Britonic languages, we also move onto a new medium text. Although oral transmission is an important part of folklore, that doesn't mean that folklore can't also be transmitted by text, it just means we have to bear in mind that this is one version we're learning about. The Mabinogion are a set of stories that were compiled in Middle Welsh in the 12th and 13th centuries from earlier oral traditions. All told, there are 11 prose stories containing the text, none attributed to an identifiable author, suggesting the same lack of individual ownership that is common to folklore the world over. We were taking a look at one of the stories, Clothin Clefelis, and particularly to a race of beings from Welsh mythology known as the Coronaid. Clothin Clefelis concerns two brothers, Cluth, who becomes the King of Britain, and his younger brother Clefelis, who marries the Princess of France and becomes king there. Three plagues fall upon Britain soon after. The Coronaid, who can hear anything the winds carry and so know everything and cannot be forced out. A scream that comes every May Eve and causes women to become barren and men to lose their senses. And provisions that begin to disappear, no matter how much food is prepared, after the first night it's all vanished. Cluth consults his brother Clefelis, and Clefelis offers him solutions to each plague. The Cronaid can be killed by making a mixture from a certain insect which will be harmless to the Britons. The scream is caused by a red dragon fighting a white dragon and this can be stopped by setting a trap for them putting them to sleep with mead, and then burying them underground. The final plague is caused by a magician, who's making everyone fall asleep and then stealing all of their food. 
Pruth can use a vat of cold water to keep himself awake and then confront him. Following his brother's advice, Cruz rids himself and the island of the three plagues. But what do the plagues stand for, and why were they passed down by Welsh speakers? As there are multiple versions of the plagues, including a reference in one of the Welsh triads, we can learn more about them. Triad 36 is called Three Oppressions That Came to This Island and Not One of Them Went Back, and as translated by Rachel Bromwich reads, One of them was the people of the Coronayad, who came here in the times of Caspoloan, son of Beli, and not one of them went back, and they came from Arabia. The second oppression, the Guthrifichti, and not one of them went back. The third oppression, the Saxons, with Horsa and Henkist as their leaders. So in this instance we see locations, suggesting that the plagues refer to invaders rather than to dragons and magicians. Guthrifichti is a term that apparently refers to the Picts, a group of peoples who lived in northern and eastern Scotland in late antiquity and the early Middle Ages. The Saxons were early Germanic peoples who came from the German North Sea coast. But what about the Coronayad? Shona David suggests in her translation of the Mabinogion that the name Coronayad may well have been confused with Caesarea, meaning Romans. This would make the three oppressions the Romans, the Picts and the Saxons. History hidden in the story, which ties into our original Fluth and Fleur story too, as the dragons are suspected to be linked to the red dragon that is present on the Welsh flag to this day. However, there are some alternate suggestions. In their book, Fairy, A Guide to the Law, Magic and World of the Good Folk, Cruz and Damir suggest that the Coronai may well be fairies, fairies being a prevalent feature in all kinds of Celtic folklore. Manly Pope translated Cluth and Clufelis back in 1862 and suggested as well that while the Coronai was likely to refer to invaders, that those being referred to were a tribe from the East Midlands. However, as some of Pope's other suggestions and connections seem unlikely to be true, it seems to be generally agreed that the Coronayad are referring to Romans. The story, the triad and other references to the Coronayad are an interesting look at how history is passed down orally and why. These short tales help to impart vital information in a memorable way, ensuring that if these plagues returned, future generations would be ready for them. Cornwall is famous for a great many things. Its coastline, Poldark, as a setting for various novels and short stories, including some by Agatha Christie and Daphne du Maurier, and of course, the ubiquitous Cornish pasty. We are going to take a look at food now, but not the pasty, unfortunately. Now, instead we're going to take a look at the legend of Tom Borcock and a unique Cornish dish called Stargazy Pie. Firstly though, how does food connect to folklore at all? So folklorists, along with everything else, also often study what are called food ways. So this is a study of culture through food. In particular, this means foods that are transmitted folklorically, so they are passed on through informal and traditional means. In a blog post, Jeannie Jorgensen explained this as, we study the preparation, selection, consumption and preservation of foods, ranging from recipes and meal assembly to the norms and rituals governing consumption. So what does this mean in practice? Well, one major area that folklorists seem to study is holiday food, so food that different people eat around major holidays that they celebrate. Although there may be a core handful of dishes, for example, a traditional British Christmas dinner may include a turkey, mashed potatoes and vegetables, there's also variation in both additional dishes and in how the whole thing is prepared. This may be something you've noticed if you spent time at a partner or a friend's house at a holiday instead of your own. Things are probably similar, but there's some key differences. Food is an important area of study for folklorists because it doesn't just provide us with physical nourishment, it also helps us to build a shared identity. And depending on the food and the occasion, food ways can be linked to religious, ethnic, regional and gender identity in ways that tell folklorists more about different groups. So, that's food ways, but who on earth is Tom Borcock? Legend has it that Tom Borcock was a man from the village of Muzzle in Cornwall and worked as a local fisherman in the 16th century. One winter, the weather was particularly stormy and the fishing boats couldn't leave the harbour. As Christmas approached, the villagers were facing starvation. Fish was their primary source of food and because the boats couldn't leave, there'd been no catch brought in. Tom Borcock decided to brave the storm and went out in his fishing boat. Despite the stormy weather and the incredibly difficult seas, he managed to catch enough fish to feed the entire village. This catch, which supposedly included seven types of fish, although now pilchards, sardines are mostly used, was baked into a pie, which had the fish heads poking through the pastry on top to prove that they were inside. And that's why it's called Stargazy Pie, because the fish heads are pointing up so they can look at the stars. 
Since the 1950s, villagers in Muzzle have held the Tom Borcox Eve Festival on the 23rd of December every year, and the celebration includes the villagers parading a large stargazy pie around during the evening, along with a procession of handmade lanterns before they eat the pie. But where did the legend come from? So some people suspected that the landlord of the ship inn, Muzzle's Pub, made the whole thing up. There are no records of the festival exactly as it is before the 1950s, and it was his idea to celebrate the legend as part of the Muzzle Christmas celebrations, but it may be that this idea came from earlier celebrations that had taken place in the village. Robert Morton Nance, an author on the Cornish language, recorded festivities that took place prior to the 1900s in an article he wrote for the magazine Old Cornwall in 1927. In fact, there was an older festival held by fishermen at the end of December which included a pie cooked with different fish inside to represent the variety of catches the men hoped to achieve in the coming year. There's also been a long history of mid-winter festivals associated with mining communities and tin mining was another huge industry across much of Cornwall. We also have references to stargazy pie in the stories collected by Robert Hunt, which were published as popular romances of the west of England in 1865 indicating that the pie was made, being made much before the 1950s. In one story, called The Devil's Quoits, etc., he tells of why the devil never came into Cornwall. Because when he crossed the Tamar and made Tor Point for a brief space his resting place, he could not but observe that everything, vegetable or animal, was put by the Cornish people into a pie. He saw and heard of fishy pie, stargazy pie, conger pie, and indeed pies of all the fishes in the sea, of parsley pie and herby pie, of lammy pie and piggy pie, and pies without number. Therefore, fearing they might take a fancy to a devilly pie, he took himself back again into Devonshire. Tom Borcock and his stargazy pie, then, tell us more about the reliance of the people of Cornwall on their fishing industry, their justified superstitions around trying to get enough catch, and how the community comes together for their version of a midwinter festival and to prepare a dish that is important to their regional cultural heritage. And so finally, let's travel to Brittany and learn more about the dreaded Anko. In all of our Britonic languages, Breton, Cornish and Welsh, the Anko is the servant of death. Initially, he was described as a being that was tasked to perpetuate the cycle of life and death, similar to other deities from Celtic mythology like Susilus, the Gaul god of nature, life and death, or Dagda, the Irish god of druids and the land of the dead. However, over time, the Anko has become solely associated with death and is increasingly thought of as a grim reaper-like psychopomp. The name Anko is, according to Dom Le Pelletier in his Etymological Dictionary published in 1752, related to the plural of the Breton word Anken, which means anguish or grief. Alternatively, Anko has also been related to the Breton word Anquat, which means to forget. As for the Anko's origins, well, there are a lot of different stories around that. Some people say that the last person to die before the new year, or the first person to die in the new year, becomes an anchor and is responsible for collecting all the others who die that year, as well as watching over the local graveyard. Only after doing this can they too enter the afterlife. There's a myth too that Anchor was originally a prince who had a thirst for hunting and enjoyed watching animals and people suffer and die. During one hunt, he and his companions chased down a stag, only to come across a stranger clothed all in black and riding a white horse. Anka challenged the stranger to a contest. Whoever killed the stag would keep the meat and decide the other person's fate. The stranger won. He revealed he was death and told Anka that as he enjoyed killing so much, he would be responsible from then on for hunting and collecting corpses. Like hearing the Irish banshees scream, hearing the creak of the Anka's cart drawn by skeletal horses in some stories, or one skeletal and one healthy in others, heralds death. It's also said that the Anko roams anonymously among the crowds attending Midnight Mass on Christmas Eve, brushing past all of those who will die before the New Year arrives. However, there are also many stories where the Anku's omen of death is less an omen and more of a warning. In most tales, the people who see him have enough time to organise their business and their succession before he comes to claim them. He usually also simply reminds the people he meets that death is inevitable, rather than hunting them down to kill them. There have been a few folklorists and scholars who've tried to understand where the Anku fits in particularly with Celtic beliefs. Psychopomps, so these manifestations of death, are common worldwide, but it is suspected that the Breton spirits of the dead particularly may well be linked to the fairies of Gaelic Celtic tradition. Walter Evans Wentz published a book called The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries in 1911, where he drew this comparison. We may now note how much the same are the powers and nature of the dead and spirits in Brittany, and the power and nature of the fairy races in Celtic Britain and Ireland. 
Thus, the Breton dead strike down the living just as fairies are said to do. The Anku, who is a king of the dead, and his subjects, like a fairy king and fairies, have their own particular paths or roads over which they travel in great sacred processions, and exactly as fairies, the hosts of the dead are in possession of the earth on November Eve, and the living are expected to prepare a feast and entertainment for them. It appears, then, that the Anku is drawn from Celtic fairy belief, but with the conversion to Christianity, these beliefs could well have taken on a darker tone. Belief of fairy in other Celtic countries does involve some fear, but also a healthy respect that is of ancient origin. However, the macabre view of Christian death almost certainly coloured Breton perception of spirits, often clashing with the pre-Christian view as it did throughout much of Europe. Evan Wentz concludes, The Bretons may be said to have a death faith, whereas the other Celts have a fairy faith, and both are a real folk religion innate in the Celtic nature, and thus quite as influential as Christianity. We might say that all of Brittany is a land of the dead, an ancient Karnak its centre, just as Ireland is fairyland with its centre at ancient Tara. Death and manifestations of death are and always have been part of the human experience. But what the anchor shows us is how different folk groups interpret it. Here, Celtic tradition may have been impacted by institutional Christian beliefs, leading to a folk tradition that meets somewhere in the middle of two clashing cultures. And there are still statues of Anku that remain in Brittany to this day, watching over graveyards and burial sites to move restless spirits over to the other side, whichever other side that may be. So these examples are all well and good, but most are of a historical, somewhat ancient tradition, and they may not be believed as often today. So why would we talk about them? Because folklore lives on, and like-